Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the MIT Bitcoin Expo panel on central bank digital currency. Um, just want to kind of let everyone know in the room, you know, this is a really important topic. Anyone here that gets paid in dollars or has some dollars in your pocket, this affects you. And so we're hoping today that we'll learn a bunch and uh, more importantly that you'll start following this project because uh, you're going to have a role and a stake in it. Joining me today from, for the panel discussion, we have four members from the Federal Reserve and Tyler Frederick, who is one of the original founding members of uh, this project. And uh, so to my left here is Bob Bench, the Assistant Vice President of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Um, Anders Brownworth, who is the, um, from the, on, so he's on the policy, so we have two people on the policy side. We have uh, Bob and uh, Rob, and Rob is a policy researcher at the Federal Reserve, and Anders, who is the principal architect on the technology side, and James Lovejoy, who is the senior software architect of the CBDC project for, the Fed, for, the, for Bank Boston. Um, so, guys, um, you know, just telling, getting into the story a little bit about what's going on here, uh, what, you know, what you've done so far. Why did the Boston Fed decide a CBDC research project was necessary? Uh, thanks, and, uh, and I'll do a quick disclaimer for all of us who are members of the Boston Fed. Um, everything we say today uh, is our opinions alone, are not opinions of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, the Federal Reserve System, or the Federal Board of Governors. And then also, uh, importantly, everything we do as a team is technology research only. Uh, policy is the exclusive remit of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. We don't do policy. We, we try to build cool things and learn from them. Uh, and then finally, uh, this CBDC project we're going to talk about today uh, is a research project in and of itself. It, it should not be seen as an indication of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors' uh, preference for or against a central bank digital currency. Again, that is their decision alone. Um, so let's get to the first question is why. You know, I'll, you know, I, I'll say you know, this team is pretty special as are uh, some of our other team members. Um, and uh, we'll talk about them later because they're really important contributors. Uh, but generally speaking, there's a big question, is that a lot of people at this university and around the world have been working on new types of technology for the past, I'll call it 14 years now, of understanding how money can work differently. Um, and that's 14 years of hard labor by a lot of brilliant women and men to think about money differently. And so we are now, like I said, 14 years later, this, this idea started in a room in downtown Boston with Tyler and I, um, which really was, okay, we got some of the smartest women and men in the world working on this stuff. Is there any use case here to the public mission uh, of central bank money? Is any of this useful? And, and let's start taking brilliant women and men who have designed this software, built this software, and then maintain the software in production. Those are three really important skill sets to have. And then understand what about this software is useful to us and what isn't. And so the big idea was take all these learnings from the past 15, 14, 15 years, tear it apart and say, what's good for the central bank use case? What helps our, what's helps our mission? And then what might not be helpful? And, and then provide that data to the decision makers so that as we think about the future of money, we can do so in an extremely informed way. Great. Um, you know, um, Knowing some of your backgrounds in crypto and everything, it always kind of brings a smile to my face when I think, you know, the, you know, the Boston Fed decides that it wants to build a CBDC and they go out and hire a bunch of Bitcoin maxis to, to build it for them. Uh, you know, it's just, it's a, it's, it's a great story. So tell me a little bit about what role Bitcoin played in this um, and some background about, um, uh, you know, the partnership that you've had with DCI and those great people with Neha and Taj and everyone. Um, again, a bunch of guys, that, a bunch of folks that I consider are Bitcoin maxis and stuff, and how that kind of played into your team and the dynamic of uh, working together. Oh, senior scientist, I'll let you handle that one. Okay, uh, yeah, well, so first of all, I mean, there's a lot to learn from a technology perspective, and, you know, why wouldn't you look at what exists? Why wouldn't you look at what's working? Why wouldn't you borrow from it? Why wouldn't you, uh, you know, consider how the whole system works and, and all that? And, and you know, that, that's not to say everything is, is translatable one-to-one. -to -one. Uh, it's a different use case that we're building for, but uh, there's a lot that's, that's very, very well understood, and there's a lot that we can, uh, we can draw from. So, uh, you, you know, it really is, I mean, you know, everyone, probably everyone here has a, their sort of Bitcoin rabbit hole moment and, you know, they, they kind of 
dove down and figured out well, like, why this completely irrational looking system hangs together and works extremely well in the real world after you know, uh, you know, a trillion dollars and, and millions of people trying to you know, essentially attack it. So that, that demands respect. You must understand that there is something there that uh, you know, is very valuable. And so you know, let's, let's take it and learn from it and uh, you know, really build something that, that stresses it and, uh, and uh, you know, kind of makes it perform in ways that uh, you know, it hasn't before. So why did it make sense to make this an open source project? So yeah, who, who should dive into that one? I, I can take that one, yeah. yeah. So uh, there's this saying that I think Neha originally coined where she said, you know, there's no point in having security through obscurity. And a lot of the culture of, it seems, software engineering and government so far has been that you need to lock it down, keep it closed, you know, have it highly audited internally, and then not make it open so that people can't find the issues. Whereas what we found in open source, you know, with Linux, with Bitcoin, with all these projects that are used in you know, massive production systems that host really important stuff, um, having an open code base, having more eyes on the software, it, it can only be a good thing. You know, you don't get security from hiding from your problems. So having this open, collaborative environment it is just going to be much more conducive to better innovation and better security. So I, I think it's a no-brainer to have open source for a project like this. And the only thing that I would add into this is um, looking at it from a different angle and talking about how does collaboration work with other central banks. I mean, I think one of the things that we take to heart is we need to evaluate whether or not this is something that we want or not. And we're approaching it not saying that we want to prove that CBDC is the right solution, but addressing it as could it be or should it be? So when we tie back to the collaboration part, open source allows us to work with other central banks as well as the bright minds from the private sector to build something um, and, and to ultimately answer this question of is a CBDC something that the United States should follow through with or is this something that we determine that there are other solutions that do address maybe the problems that exist currently? Yeah, I think and the board you know, released that discussion paper, right? And that mostly focuses on, on policy issues, but I think it makes sense to have a code base that you can leave comment on as well. And for me, I found that it's very hard, at least for me, to tangibly discuss something until I've started coding it because I don't fully understand the problem yet. Um, and I think that's true for anyone working on this. So if you really want to comment on CBDC or come up with an idea, you really need to you know, get your hands in the code and, and start writing stuff. So. So we're so used to government projects coming in, you know, over budget and uh, not enough results, but your team actually accomplished something here where you gave us, instead of one design for a CBDC, you gave us two designs. And so I was thinking, like, so how did this happen? Like, you, did you start with the atomizer designs, find the bottlenecks, and start thinking, like, hey, there's better ways to do this? Um, yeah, uh, so, so I'll, I'll tell the story, what, what happened, you know, Pretty early on, we're looking at the system and saying, "Okay, let's let's take uh, what is essentially a very monolithic system. You know, Bitcoin is essentially a demon that that does the the chatty network. The uh, you know, it's it's dealing with uh, signing and everything, checking blocks, recording and everything. It does absolutely everything in one demon. What if you were to you know kind of chop that up, do the things that you can parallelize?" in a parallelized way, and then look at the pieces of it that, uh, that maybe you, you kind of, you have to serialize. And, uh, you know, let's build a system and do that. And like, let's completely strip down things as far as possible so that it's as light as possible and can execute as fast as possible. And we found, probably not too surprisingly in, in hindsight, that there's a bottleneck. And that bottleneck is in that little piece that serializes all the transactions. So, uh, you know, we were thinking, uh, Neha was talking about this, and Taj was thinking about sort of a different way to do things. And, and uh, you know, we, we kind of alighted upon the question, do you really need to have a materialized list of what transaction happened in what order globally for everyone? So if I buy a hot dog in California and you buy a hot dog in New York, does it matter who, who bought the hot dog before who? You know, it doesn't, I don't think. Or at least I haven't figured out a, a, a reason why. So, uh, so then we just decided to sort of parallelize that as much as possible. So where bills are not 
used in uh, you know w one transaction that doesn't use the same bills as another transaction don't conflict. So suddenly we had this ability to you know make that system scale really, really very, very much faster than where we were before. I think one thing I'll also add to the government question, right? Like, you know, I won't talk about our budget, um, but I can say that you know we did things differently here, um, and importantly, MIT did things differently. I, I cannot understate. Um, for those of you who may work in the public sector, private sector, what type of partner MIT is, uh, it, it's incredible partnership that these folks bring, and the level of overcommitment that they bring to your project is unparalleled, and I've been doing this for a while in private and public sector. But the cool thing about it is, you know, talking about this launch from Atomizer to PC and how we worked, you know, at the end of the day, the public's money. Um, the cool thing about open source is you can actually go into our GitHub repository and look up Metallic James and see the month where we just told James, go away and figure this thing out. Like, you know, a lot of big government projects have project manager on top of project manager on top of project manager. And we have this awesome, awesome woman named Angela Lindstrom who led um, a lot of like theoretical projects at Amazon who's just a killer project manager. But usually you have a lot of project managers and eventually you find an engineer down here somewhere. Um, you can see where we just said, James, no meetings. Like, Come to stand up, but that's about it. And then James just lived in the code base for a month and figured out that bottleneck, right? And like that's the really cool stuff is you don't even have to ask like look at bills or, or timesheets. You can just look at GitHub and see where James didn't sleep for a month and figured out that lily pad jump that it takes for great engineers to solve big problems, right? And um, oftentimes in private sector, for those of you in big private sector companies or public sector, sometimes too much project management gets in the way of those lily pad learnings, right, of just thinking broadly and having time to think broadly. And that was a huge learning for me as a, as a leader of a team of sometimes I just need to give up control and let, and one, always hire people smarter than you. Like that's rule A1, only hire people smarter than you if you can find them. And then two, give them space to be smart. And I think that's one thing that led to this being such a successful project. Let, let go and let James go, you know, do, Bingo. do his thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, I think that you guys kind of gave me a great segue into the next, the next thing I wanted to, to kind of cover was I created some slides uh, so we could all kind of visualize what you built, um, you know, uh, slides from the Hamilton project um, that you built. And so, uh, James, if you wouldn't mind uh, going through the atomizer and the, um, and, uh, slide. Um, sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, so we built, as Manish said, and if you've read the paper, you'll see the description, but we built uh, two architectures. Um, this is actually the one we built first, which was Atomizer. And our initial thinking here, as was alluded to, is you know, taking the sort of Bitcoin structure, you know, with a blockchain transactions ordered into blocks and seeing how we can scale it out. So, you know, Bitcoin has a relatively small number of UTXOs in its database, uh, and the assumption would be for a CBDC, it would probably be in the billions, right? So. The thinking was we need to partition our database. So this is why we have the shards. And then because it's a centralized system, we don't need mining anymore. So we have a replicated service, the atomizer, which is effectively the block producer that's aggregating the transactions together and producing blocks. Um, what's cool and common to both architectures is the data retention by the central bank is really minimized. So this sentinel layer that actually validates transactions, uh, it digests the transaction into a series of hashes, so it removes the values uh, and the public keys. And so those aren't actually retained in the database. So the thinking there is you know, that increases privacy. And maybe in the future, you know, we can get really clever with the Sentinel and use zero knowledge proofs so you don't even have to you know, provide the actual transaction data to the Sentinel. Um, but I mean, as you can kind of tell from the architecture, and if you're familiar with blockchains, you'll know that they're pretty slow, right? And, and this has the same problem, which is that all the transactions have to go through this one pipe, which is the atomizer service. And we were able to meet our target, our original target that I think Tyler came up with was 100K and five seconds to finality. So we got that. You know, we were able to get this up to 170K and I think under two seconds to finality. But uh, I think we got to sort of December in the project and we were like, hmm feel like we can do better than this, right? Um, so yeah, so then we built two-phase commit, which is the second architecture, and that uses a much more traditional distributed systems approach uh, using the two-phase commit protocol. And the key point there is just to remove this atomizer bottleneck. So there's no longer a global ordering of transactions. Uh, transactions are only ordered relative to each other if they are submitted at the same time and they conflict. So that means you can 
parallelize transaction execution by just increasing the number of partitions in your system. And on the assumption that you know, people aren't all paying the same person, um, you can scale out that way. So in the end, that one got, I think we tested up to 1.7 million transactions per second with less than one second tail latency, but we only tested it out to 32 shards. You know, if you tried it with 64 or 128, it would get higher than 1.7 million. So this is a really future-proof architecture. You know, in the future, if people are going to be doing IoT, you know, IoT with CBDC or you know, microtransactions, who knows? Theoretically, you could scale to accommodate it. The only question would be, I think, cost. You know, how many servers do you need? How much of AWS is being consumed to run it? What was the AWS bill on this testing? You, you don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, oh, actually, that's a good question. You probably have requirements. Like, I mean, Tyler kind of, this was a cold startup. Like, this was absolutely a cold startup in government, um, which is rare. Uh, and we have to thank our leadership at the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston for supporting us on that, on, on, on building a true cold startup in government. But I mean, Tyler, do you want to talk about requirements and how you kind of came to those numbers and what you thought about with this, how this thing should be built? Yeah, I, I think one of the, um, one of the aspects of this project is we wanted to solve hard problems, right? You know, when, when you get an opportunity with a lot of green field in front of you, you want to solve the hard problems. So we wanted to figure out how can you do something that's extremely scalable. So like James said, you know, let's try to fit everything onto the layer. Let's get a performant layer one, right? Like let's not rely on net settlement or, you know, layer twos or roll ups. To start with, let's make a performant L1. Let's get to a minimum of 100,000 transactions per second, go from there, you know, and then, you know, we said, well, what if this enables crazy stuff like micropayments or, you, you know, you pay, you know, a few cents for a song or a news article or something like that, we could get way higher than 100,000 transactions per second. Um, we wanted something that was nearly instant, right? Um, you know, we have a lot of instant payment methods. You know, you have your credit cards and, you know, you can use the analogy to cash, right? Obviously the cash payment is instant. Uh, but we wanted to see if you can do something that settles those payments uh, within five seconds or basically instantly, uh, you know, as we eventually got to. Um, we also wanted to look at security, right? You know, this thing is, you know, if, if, a, if a central bank were to hypothetically launch something like this, it would be hacked at a lot, right? You know, this would be incredibly sensitive, and you can't have a system like this failing. Um, so security was... Uh, uh, was an intense priority for us as well. Um, so, you know, this is, it, was a, it was a cool opportunity to kind of think, to take a step back and say, all right, if we, you know, kind of taking the things we learned from crypto, you know, the folks in crypto, we've had the opportunity to move fast and break things. And, you know, you can't really do that with the U.S. financial system. Um, so this was a cool opportunity being a technical research project to take a step back and just, you know, brainstorm what is possible um, and that was, that was one of my favorite aspects of this project. Um, yeah, so I put the throughput slide up there, and, you know, considering that, you know, um, it looks like, you know, there may be, there, you know, according to James, I think we, we could, this could go a lot faster than 1.7 million transactions per second. Is that? Yeah, I mean, well, you can see we tested it out to 32, but if you look at the trend, it's not seeming to slow down. So I think if you try it with more, it would go faster. The other thing to consider is, you know, we didn't spend a ton of time, like, really deeply optimizing the code base. You know, if we put this in production and you had, like, a team of, you know, five or ten performance engineers really trying to get as much as possible out of it, it would probably go even faster than this. I mean, this is research code right now. So. And that's, what, that's a good thing to just segue there, James. This is open source code. This is truly free and open source under the MIT license. So if any, we have any performance en engineers here or any with lots of extra AWS spend to do and you want to test that and push that up higher, we encourage you to engage in this open source effort. Great. You notice at eight shards, um, there seems to be, it seems to be that the atomizer kind of slows down. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so the, I mean, there's this balancing act, right? So the, the atomizer is the bottleneck in the system and so it has to do a lot of work. It has to aggregate these transactions, eliminate the double spans, and then distribute the blocks back to the shards. So once you start increasing the number of shards, it actually adds more work to the atomizer. It doesn't help anymore. Um, so at some point, you know, once you get to eight, that seems to be the optimal number. Once you get to 16, 
it seems to be just too much bandwidth to really increase the throughput. Great. So my favorite thing about this project is that it shows us that there is a potential scalable solution for a non-intermediated non system. Uh, that kind of really, that's where I get, like, I see your Bitcoin background in, in that part of the design. Uh, I wanted to hear a little bit on the technical side and a little bit on the policy side about, um, you know, uh, why that was important to you. Probably let you handle uh, these questions. Yeah, so um, what I would say to that is one of the things that, you know, Tyler was touching upon was we were setting out in the beginning to with these requirements, right, throughput, speed, resiliency. One of the big learnings that we had later on um, when we were wrapping up our phase one work was flexibility was going to be really important. We wanted a system because we don't know what it's going to look like or what it could be to have the possibility to change, right? So one of the things that makes this project really interesting is retail is a tough problem, as you know, we've kind of alluded to. There, you know, it's, if you're trying to, you can use cash for anything, right? And people do use cash for a lot of things. So we needed to make sure that we built technology that could work in a bunch of different ways. Sure, you could make it intermediated, but we also wanted to say, well, that's, that's kind of copping out. We're, we're almost making it easier if we, if we change to that route. It's way, way, way more difficult if we do a direct retail CBDC research. So that's where we wanted to tackle. Um, I'll let these guys touch upon the actual, you know, what that looks like, but you know, that was the goal in building a flexible system. Yeah, I, th I think the idea there is we see intermediation as a policy decision, right? Intermediation is a decision by policymakers, and that's best left to Congress or governors, administration, treasury, right? And, um, but the, what you don't want to do as a technologist is, especially in our role, is take choices away from people. Right? We want to give the broadest possible choice set. The same way with our, with our data model. Right? Our data model collects almost no data. There is a multitude of opportunities and, and additional layers to collect data to do the necessary work of compliance and national security uh, if you choose so. But if you, by default, collect all that data, you're taking choices away from policymakers. And so our goal when our model was, can we build a highly performant, secure, flexible, resilient system, and then let policymakers take advantage of that flexibility? So I look at it a little bit differently. I want us, the people, to kind of uh, decide how um, a non what a non-intermediated system means for us. Uh, it could mean the first time that we can actually do business with our own central bank directly as citizens without these intermediaries. Uh, there's a huge opportunity here. Um, and I think that this is one of the main things to take away from this talk is that we all you know, get to elect the officials and how they look at our rights. Um, we've had in the past, you know, um, times that, you know, we've had some of those rights taken away, but we can really, really uh, play a part in this because uh, this is possible now. A non-intermediated system that allows you to, to, con to conduct business directly with their central bank. Um, I think that's one of the great things that came out of this. I will say that the board discussion paper does lean towards a preference of intermediation, but that, that is, that's why they have the policy tools. We just build the tech. <clears throat> so with that, you know, um, before the talking heads take over and start telling us that we can't handle this type of system where we uh, can control our own private keys and, uh, like I said, you know, work with, directly with our central bank, um, there is one trade-off that occurred by making this non-intermediate, and that is that the recipient needs to uh, receive from the sender uh, some data in order to spend their, spend their uh, funds further. So um, I'd love to get our group here educated on this, and I think you'll all find that we can really all handle this. So um, James, if you could just explain what we're looking at here. Um, yeah, well, okay, so this is a Bitcoin conference, right? So you should be pretty familiar with this. This is, this is an output, right? So in, it's the same as in Bitcoin. So you've got the transaction ID and the index of the output in the transactions, that's the out point. And then you have the, um, what would be in Bitcoin, the script hash, and then the value. Um, so because the chain isn't public, right? So, so this is kind of an interesting thing. When people do user research, the thing people say, which is surprising to me, is that they're worried about a CBDC making their transactions public to their peers. Like, I, I worry about 
my transactions being given to the government, right? But they worry about, you know, is my friend seeing, you know, how much I'm spending on their birthday gift, right? Like, that's their concern. So um, in Bitcoin and in Ethereum and most cryptocurrencies, this is all public information and you can see it. Uh, whereas in Hamilton and OpenCBDC, it's not. So in order for you to spend your money, uh, you need to know your out point, um, which it turns out is like kind of subtle. And so, Without an intermediary, I would need to give you this information out of band. There's no way for you to just make it up, right? Because you don't know what the transaction ID is. So that's an opportunity for intermediaries, right? Is having them be a wallet provider and provide this service to communicate this data between people. Uh, but that is a choice that would have to be made. But yeah, I mean, you need a private key and you need this, and then you can spend your money. So that's pretty exciting. So it's basically we'd have to share these four bits of information with each other in order for us to kind of peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, send funds and reuse them over and over again. Is that about accurate? Yeah, and I mean, right now, what we implemented so far is a very simple script that just is pay to public key hash, basically. But it could be arbitrary. And you know, we're looking into smart contracts, we're looking into you know, different types of scripts and the sort of security issues, usability issues around that. So the sky is really the limit, I think, in, in transaction semantic sense. What was the biggest challenge in creating like a non-intermediated system? Like what were you thinking about when you were thinking like, well, this needs to work in either way? Well, I'll just take that Yeah, one. like the, so, you, you, might, you might stop and say, okay, well, you did these things because of X, Y, and Z. We did, we did most things that we did here to make it fast. We got rid of this, some of this data because it's faster not to have that encumbered in the middle of the system. Could we build a system on the side that holds it? Yeah, but it, it was really just let's strip down as much as possible. So literally the only thing in the state is, is this token spent or not? That's it. If, if there's a key there, it is spent. If it is not there, it is not spendable. That's it, nothing else. That's a very different paradigm. So like you'll, you'll see like a lot of these things. And, and you know, the, other, the other obvious one, I think, is you know, if you're doing, uh, let's just say, a million transactions a second, uh, and you're trying to push that data publicly, who can take that? Like that's that's like terabytes of information a day at at least. I mean, I I know you know I, I haven't done the math, but like you know 100 150 k or something like that is like terabytes a day. So a millions, like forget it. So uh, you know that's just a very practical you know kind of thing. You you can't take that kind of you know uh, throughput in, onto your cell phone or something like that. It's just not possible. So yeah, and I think I think kind of reemphasizing this. Now, what we've built to date is a core processing engine, right? A core processing engine that moves a very small amount of data extremely fast. Uh, and I think the idea there was intermediation is, again, a policy decision. And policymakers can make that decision. And, and, and they're leaning that way, um, definitely based on the Federal Reserve paper, the board paper. Um, but you know, I think assuming that really can limit your thinking, the same way we approach the compliance question. Right, the Bank Secrecy Act, you know, is a fairly fixed thing that happened in 1970, in the early 1970s, right? And so, thinking, you know, trying to take brilliant software engineers and saying you must, from the start, think about that, really can limit how limit your technology options. And these are all things that are solvable in additional layers if policymakers want to put these layers on top. But really focusing and just being, I mean, this is like any kind of software development. Just thinking about what are the absolute north stars that you need to think about when you're building and focus on that. And just don't be distracted by anything but your North Stars. And then later, you can always build things later on. But you know, I think this team did an incredible job just keeping their heads down and saying, how can we take everything we've learned over the past 15 years and build the most secure performance system possible? And, and this is the result. Hey, let's talk about some big questions, OK? Um, are we replacing cash? Is that what we're doing here? Lynn, you want to handle that one? Yeah, I'll answer that one. <laughs> no, um, I, I think, yeah, I, I, resoundingly no. I think cash works, right? And there, there's a reason why cash works and people are excited about cash. And I think, you know, when we talk about studying these systems, we're looking at what goes on in crypto, we're looking at what goes on in fintech, but we're also looking at what exists, what systems have worked and how, what can we learn from them? I remember Tyler and I had a conversation looking up 
well, cash transactions are instant. No, they're not. They average, on average take about 40 seconds between giving somebody the cash, they put it in the register, they give you the change. We, we looked into this kind of stuff, um, which, which may seem weird, and, but you know, obviously cash is a system, like I said, that is effective. It does work currently, and we're not trying to replace it, but there are learnings that we can get from cash that we think can impact what a central bank digital currency could be. Um, yeah, so that's how I'd, in, I'd answer that question. Um, so, going, you know, talking further about the central bank and its role in this, um, you know, one thing about cash is that if we say, for instance, we ended up in some sort of like negative interest rate environment, um, you know, people would just take their money and put it under their mattress, you know. Um, but in this system, we've digitized everything, and what type of, you know, it seems like there could be a, um, a downside to having digital cash when. Um, when you, if you hold your bank with it, you know, if, if your bank is holding digital currency that they can, you know, charge this negative interest rate that you can't take out of the digital form. I'm going to be the, the only person I guess who can answer this. The Federal Reserve has some of the world's most brilliant economists, right? Um, no one on the Federal Reserve team here is one of those economists, so we do not talk about interest rates. They are brilliant, brilliant people with no interest rates in the Federal Reserve system. We are not them. So up from the Federal Reserve staff, I'm going to be the boss now and say, no talking about interest rates. Fair enough. Um, so, you know, we've talked a lot of we've talked about a lot of the positives of this um, of this project, and you know, there is a scary side to this project. Um, you know, could, could you know, is this potentially if we if if uh, policyholders have their way, uh, policymakers have their way, could turn into some sort of form of like surveillance on uh, our spending. I'll quickly go into like the scary side, right? I think one thing that we're super proud about is that doing open source research, doing you know, you know, edge techno technological research is scary. is is a big challenge. Like one huge credit I want to give to like the leadership of the Federal Reserve System, the leadership in the board, leadership in Boston is like we've been encouraged every step of the way. Uh, we have to know this stuff. We have to get smarter. Um, and taking people who have all have backgrounds in crypto to come into government saying we want to you know, sh you know. Here's a here's some here's a little bit of budget. Do some great stuff and support and incredible support. You know that's I think a lot of different types of leadership may not be open for that. And I think that was one thing that we were happy that we saw such faith and courage in our, in our team and build in our building of the team. But I'll let you all talk about. I don't know who wants to talk about the surveillance question, but from the I think the, I mean I, I, someone else can grab the surveillance question. I can comment on it a little bit. Um, I think for any system that you're building, it matters what the goals of the system are. So if you want to build a system that is to survey the people, you can build it, right? I think one of the approaches that we have right now is, like Anders mentioned, um, is we are not trying to collect a ton of data. But I think it's important to do the sort of scenario analysis that it may be of like what could a system look like. I think it's important also to keep in mind that we're, you know, this is not something that, you know, the government is going to just build just to have it, you know, we care about privacy. Privacy, I think, is especially to the crypto community, you know, a really important factor of why I may use one service over another one. So, you know, obviously, you know, surveillance is a big concern, and I think it's important to kind of take that input in and say, what, how can we build the best system possible? So, um, you know, surveillance is tough, and there are other central banks that may have that agenda, but right now it's not being one that's communicated to us, and, and you know, all we have to go off of is, like I said, what are the goals, and you know, where do we get that feedback? So, yeah. I think one thing I would add is there are a bunch of potential objections to a central bank digital currency, right? And those come from people with a wide variety of backgrounds, right? You have policymakers, you have economists who don't like the idea of a central bank digital currency. You know, we're at a Bitcoin conference, so I bet a number of us here probably don't like the idea of you know, the government researching a central bank digital currency. Um, you know, I think it's super important that you know, we don't stick our heads in, in the sand and just kind of ignore uh, the changing world around us. And I, I think that's one of the great things that this, the, the Fed team, the Boston Fed team is, is doing. They're working on the technical side. And, and I think it's really important um, you know, sometimes you hear, well, policymakers need to do the policy research and technical guys need to do the technical research. There needs to be cross-pollination. You can't, you can't determine policy without understanding what the technology is capable of. And, you know, that's really what, what this team is working on, is what is the technology 
capable of. And you know, I'm I'm not with the Fed uh, anymore. You know, I'm pleased to be with uh, Bitstamp USA. So I think I'm impartial, and I I can, I can say this uh, with this group here. Uh, this is a phenomenal team. Uh, you know. I, I think um, you know this team, you know both the Boston Fed team and, and our colleagues at MIT, they're handling this question super responsibly, and um, I have a lot of faith in these guys sitting next to me here and our MIT colleagues. And really, I you know I, I can't think of folks I would rather have working on this question. Um, <clears throat> so, staying with. Uh, the Bitcoin thing, you know, I think if we, um, I wanted to ask, you know, in terms of interoperability with crypto and smart contracts, um, is that possible, one? And two, is this better than stable coins for, in terms of onboarding into digital currency if, in fact, that interoperability is possible? Well, so I'll, I'll jump into this. So, so the, uh, uh, you know, you know, I, I think, sort to the first one, we're, we're already looking at that. We're already looking at, like, what does interoperability look like? Um, you know, we're all fascinated by the, the uh, possibility to do atomic swaps. Well, what does an atomic swap look like between a, uh, a consensus currency that, that could reorg and one that, that is, you know, essentially just stamped? Okay, this is, fi is completely final instantly. And what does that look like? Does that, you know, are, are there things, different things to worry about than, you know, a, a sort of a typical atomic swap you might do? And then, like, what are the opportunities to that? Can you actually do an atomic swap without, uh, you know, you know, some new different way? Uh, so these are these are questions that we're we're actually actively looking at right now. Um, so yeah, that's the one of the two questions I'll answer. <laughs> James, do you have an opinion on this? I'd like to get your feedback on interoperability. Yeah, there are so many opportunities for efficiency, you know, not just interoperating with the cryptocurrency space, but interoperating with existing payment systems, you know, foreign CBDC projects that may come up. Um, you know, there's no technological reason why these can't all just be pretty much instantaneous, trustless atomic swaps, rather than, you know, the highly custodial, you know, T plus one, T plus two kind of model we have now. Um, it's, it's really just a policy choice whether or not you choose to utilize those opportunities. Yeah, I think, I think what James is getting at is, and this is, this is really important conversations when people, and in, in, in technology communities, these are always brought up. You know, why don't you just do X, right? Um, you know, the, road, the, the, the roads weren't full of cars the second the internal combustion engine was built, right? It took a while to get from the horse to the car. You know, we have right now about 50 years of hardened software hardened systems, and then also harden law, rule, regulation that effectively manage the intermediated financial system, right? That is a very big thing to, and a lot, and there's a lot of, um, the stakes on any adjustment to that are really, really high. And so, you know, when we talk about us being research only and us trying to understand the technological possibilities, that's really important, right? So we can understand, you know, what about this system of the last 50 years you know, how can we look at that honestly and look at the technology and um, understand how we can make the system better? Um, but also, you know, the stakes are really high. The stakes are incredibly high in the U.S. dollar and in, in the financial system. So how do we do this carefully? And I think doing this edge research in a research mode only uh, with incredible support from around our, our, our community is really, really important. And then importantly, putting it open source. So you're not just trustlessly, you know, moving things around. Everyone can look at what we're doing. And so the brilliant people who currently manage that 50-year-old system that you know, is getting better every day but is still based on that bedrock can look at it and say, all right, what's useful here? How can we make money better? How can we make this system better? Um, and bringing on people from the crypto community and, and MIT uh, has, been really, has been incredibly critical to get those new ways of thinking into the system. If you had to choose one, who is a long-term project owner of the CBDC? Is it the Federal Reserve or Congress? Oh, oh, that's um, that's a policy decision, and we don't talk policy. <laughs> um, so, um, we also, you know, um, you cut, you shut me off. You cut me off. <laughs> uh, you know, there's a lot of different CBDC projects all over the world, and um, people often refer to the ECNY in China. Can you tell us a little bit about um, how, how we're doing relative to those projects that are out there now? 
I mean, I'll, I'll take this one because this is uh, sensitive. Um, the main idea is they're, they're in production, right? They, they have built a production system. Uh, it is currently out there, uh, and there's a lot to probably learn from it. Uh, we are very, very far from production. We are not even at a decision, production decision standpoint. As, as our chair has made clear, that is going to take a lot of stakeholders to make. And so they're in production. We're researching, um, and we hope to and we hope to keep learning in our research. So, can't do that Great. Well, we're, I had a bunch more questions, but we're out of time. And I just want to thank you all for for joining me. Uh, I also want to make one last uh, comment to you folks, and that is that. Um, I think it's going to be Congress that's going to make a lot of these decisions, and that makes you the Dow of what happens with CBDC. We need people to be informed. We need people to talk to people that aren't informed and make sure that we're electing people that want to preserve our rights because giving them away is also our fault. So um, the panelists will be available outside for questions if you, if you folks have some questions for these folks. And um, thanks so much for being here. Appreciate y'all. <laughs>